on. Angela and Tom, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks for having me. Hi, Tage. Hi, Paul. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Hello, All great. Right. Let's just dive right into it because there's a lot of crossover here. Let's start off with Tage. What issues do you see in regard to consistency with the bid process? Because that seems to be important. Sure. As far as consistency goes, um, uh, one issue that you can have, for example, is uh, your scope. For example, if if you put a scope together and I'm the contractor and I'm out there and I'm uh, going through everything and I find issues with your scope, uh, you should put into your RFP that, for example, if the bidder finds a problem with the scope, he should then notify the manager ASAP. And for example, you might want to put a timeline in there, like for example, a minimum of five days prior to the uh, you know the, the RFP, the bid submission date. Uh, this because in that scenario, you as the manager may then have to turn around and uh, obviously notify the other bidders of that potential change to the scope. Um, so that's something as far as consistency. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, another item as well would be, um, uh, for, you know, that the bidders should include the cost of uh, the materials, the disposal labor, supervision, and all equipment necessary needed for the job. Uh, believe it or not, those little things can sometimes get away from you. So Paul, from an engineering aspect, how accurate are usually these scopes of work? So that's one thing that we really pride ourselves in. I mean, obviously the scope of work is the meat and potatoes of the project. So. Um, as engineers, we are licensed to prepare those scopes of work and specifications, and we provide as much detail as humanly possible to uh, complete the project. So everything from types of fasteners used, uh, method of installation, um, complying with manufacturer guidelines, um, what type of, um, you know, how, how the work has to proceed, safety requirements, um, everything and anything that can uh, that encompasses these types of projects. So um, a lot of times people tend to overlook uh, many key important factors of projects and that's what we do as engineers to make sure that everything is all included and all encompassed in these RFPs. I actually was going to do a poll but I don't want to take the time out of the program about has anyone ever had a miscommunication on the scope of work? So if the audience just wants to send me back the comments on that, I would I would appreciate that. Um, Tage, how do timelines work? Timelines work. That seems extremely important to me when everything's going right. to get done, right? Right. So in your R in your RFP, uh, one thing you want to do is you want to let the bidders know when you're thinking of starting this project. So for example, the spring of 2021. Because if I get your RFP and let's say, for example, I'm already booked solid through until the summer, then I, I, I'm going to want to let you know that up front. Uh, another item that uh, you know you want to you could also potentially ask the bidders how long it will take to start the project once the contract has been signed and once they have their deposit. Um, also, you can ask them how long it will take to complete the project from beginning to end. Uh, those answers can also then be, for example, put in your columns and then at the time of uh, selecting the or, or choosing the winner of the bid process, you can take those answers into consideration for who you want to give the project to. Paul, um, someone's asking me, is an RFP basically a step-by-step -step plan? Is that accurate? Yes, I mean, uh, an RFP includes many of the things we've already discussed. I mean, everything from uh, terms and conditions, uh, job site requirements, the actual construction details of the, of the project at hand, uh, terms of payment, um, everything from staging equipment, and uh, time of completion. So. Um, yes, an, R an RFP includes, um, you know, all encompassing of the entire project. So um, I think that, uh, yes. So Tage, change work, change orders, right? This just sounds like it's so complicated and it sounds, to be honest with you, it sounds like a nightmare to me. Explain yeah. to me what change orders really are and how they work. 
Sure. So, so change orders are issues that you find in the field because obviously, as a bidder, when you're um, when you are providing your proposal, you are doing a visual inspection of what's there in the community. So, change orders are things that you could not see, that you could not foresee, would be an issue. So, let's say, for example, uh, you know, you're doing a, the, uh, you know, you're doing a, a a townhouse building, and for example, every uh, bay window requires an additional 30 square foot worth of insulation that nobody knew about. Um, so now that's a change order item. Um, as far as the RFP goes, though, if you're if you're the manager and you're putting your RFP together, um, unfortunately, change orders are never fun, but they are very often inevitable, and therefore, it's a good idea to just get out in front of them. So, for example, in your RFP, you might want to write in something to that effect. You know, it's possible that change orders or additional work may be identified in the field during the project. However, change orders must be authorized by management first. They need to be in writing from the contractor, you know, after they're identified, obviously, potentially accompanied by a photo documentation and also a note that change orders will not be paid unless they've been authorized. So, for example, I can't just go out, find a change order, and then just send you a bill for $500 and say, oh, by the way, I found a change order about a month ago. Here's the, here's the invoice for it. So, so uh, another, another very important item, however, about change orders is, uh, um, uh, let's say you're doing a large-scale community project. To slim down on your change orders, you can use uh, a prototype building. So, for example, let's say, all your buildings are identical or let's say you have an a building and a b building well you can pick that first a building and that first b building label those as your prototype buildings uh your engineer is there with the contractor doing the work step by step everybody sees those change orders when they occur let's say there are three static change orders that you find on those two prototype buildings you get those approved the engineer also approves them uh, now they're approved by the board, and guess what? They are change orders. However, they're static, and they're not going to change, and now you don't have to worry about it throughout the whole rest of the project. So, Paul, tell me a little bit about how specific the materials need to be identified in an RFP. Like, how how down are the details do you, do you need to get? That's a good question. I mean, there are there's there's usually a number of different options that people have with materials. So us as engineers, we always like to um, either propose options based on durability. So it gives the clients uh, the ability to make that decision as to whether they are choosing to go with a more durable or long lasting product, you know, a product that has a longer useful life or if they're strictly looking to maybe save some costs and are, are, are willing to accept and use um, materials that might have a lesser uh, life cycle. Um, it's also important to know when materials can be used together. So uh, some materials cannot be used in conjunction with each other and it's very important that that does not occur so that we don't have issues with the finished product. So material selection is, is, is crucial, highly important. Um, a lot of times we can get system uh, warranties from manufacturers. So we always look to select materials that we can offer uh, and pass on system warranties to the client. So for example, if we're doing a cladding project, we won't uh, recommend a type of cladding system that does not, you can't obtain a system warranty for. So um, we would recommend or we would put in the RFP or the specification that a, uh, a material, the material is specified and they cannot stray from that material. And that also helps to get apples to apples bids as well. So Tage, one term you threw at me, which I don't understand is bid, solic bid solicitation sheet, I mispronounced it, and an RFP, what's, what's the difference? I don't know what the difference is. So a bid solicitation sheet would be, uh, for example, uh, you're putting your RFP together and you know that there are specific materials that you're looking for. 
for um, and specific items that you want those materials installed at. So for example, let's say you're doing, you're gonna, you want to replace all of your exterior wood trim with, uh, you know, with AZAC uh, white trim. And uh, you're gonna do bay windows, you know, and palladium windows. So your bid solicitation sheet would be where essentially you're going, you're going to pigeonhole the contractor into saying, okay, uh, give me a price uh, for uh, uh, removing the wood trim and installing the AZAC PVC on a rear palladium window. Uh, and that price is going to be X. Uh, now I have to fill in that number and I realize obviously that uh, that, that price is all inclusive, meaning labor, disposal, et cetera. Uh, so that would be your essentially what a bid solicitation sheet is without going it, it can obviously go very in in depth if you when you're putting your rfp together if you're aware of all of those different components that you want to have in there the bid solicitation sheet is uh can be very useful for you now i have to watch our time because i want to make sure we don't run out of time but one thing i thought was really interesting tage when we were talking um in, in the pre-interview about scope of work you mentioned something like water sources that I would have never thought about. Could you give an example of that? Sure. So, for example, um, it would be a good idea to write in your RFP if you're doing a project such as a roof replacement project or something where you you run the risk of having water infiltration into your residences, uh, that the contractor is responsible for making every home watertight by the day by the day's end. So, for example. If they're doing a roof replacement project and they strip the whole roof, they can't just roof the front of the roof and leave the back opened, if you will, or, or unchingled. Uh, you know, it, they have to do whatever they have to do to make sure that everything gets covered up by the end of the day. Paul, another um, item that was sent over to me by the panel was that, um, like, if someone's doing a power washing job or they need a lot of a power or electricity, sometimes those things aren't put in RFPs, right? Sure. I mean, when we when we develop a specification or RFP, we absolutely include how the contractor is to um, provide things like power and water for the project. Um, that's those are um, identified within the RFP, and um, you know, in some cases, associations are willing to allow the contractor to use uh, common power. Um, but in many cases, uh, communities don't have uh, access to common power outside, common water. So uh, the last thing that you want is contractors to use um, resident power. So power that the individual residents are paying for, water that the individual residents are paying for. So those things uh, absolutely should be identified in any RFP. Um, and that would dictate whether the contractor would have to bring his own water to the site, if they're doing masonry projects, if they're doing a pressure washing project. Um, so yes, those things are, are identified within the RFP and, um, and dictated as to who is going to provide uh, the source of utilities. I'm smiling because I can just imagine the phone call with the power and the person's, the retired couple's outlet to work on the association it, project. It happens um, quite a bit. <laughs> so Tage, one important thing to touch upon is you guys want to get paid, right? So um, that would be nice. The, and how, how does the payment process work um, from a from a from your from a contractor's perspective? What are you looking for? What do you expect? So the, generally, the 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 payment. Well, depending upon the size and the duration of the project, there's typically a deposit uh, check. That deposit payment is where you're. That's money that you're going to use to purchase your materials and your setup costs, your dumpsters, et cetera. Um, and then there will be, for example, a payment plan throughout the, the project, depending upon the size of the project, again. Um, typically, though, some very important things for your RFP that you want to put in there is that the final 10% should be withheld until um, the final inspection, uh, the punch list, and cleanup is complete, which may also include the removal of the dumpsters, the removal of the restrooms, and the removal of any material storage within the community. Um, also, another very, uh, an item that's commonly forgotten about, especially in the RFPs, 
uh, is the warranty. So, for example, you might also want to put in there that that final 10% is going to be withheld until you receive the notarized manufacturer's warranty. Um, that will obviously put a fire under everybody's tail to get you your warranties because they want to get their final 10%.